Well, welcome back everybody. Uh, now, I have got the great pleasure now of interviewing Mark Strickson, who you will of course know as Turlo, uh, from his time with the Fifth Doctor. Mark, uh, you're in New Zealand there. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. I mean, I got back to New Zealand. I was in London um, um, two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago. And um, I was supposed to work on the Friday and I didn't. I went to see my mum and dad up in the north of England and I then got a flight out on the Saturday and I was on the first flight back to New Zealand in which you were quarantined for 14 days. So I went into self-isolation immediately on coming back. The only good thing about that is that it does mean I'll be out of self-isolation quicker than the people who've just gone into it. <laughs> Absolutely right. Absolutely. Well, you know, as, as you may well be aware, we are, we are now locked down here pretty much. Um, well, it's, it's no better, if it's any comfort to anybody, it's no better in New Zealand, considering where we are in the graph of cases. For, the, for our population, we have exactly the same number of cases as the UK had at that point. So we're following a very, very um, um, similar trajectory. Right. Well, then let's hope that everyone, everyone who is ill gets better and, and all of those things. And let's hope it's a, a less grim picture than we're than we're, we're told it might be. Um, but we are, of course, therefore, bringing uh, everybody an online uh, event today, which means that uh, I know we've got some of our very regular phantom people, who you will have met in real life, as well as some absolutely brand new people who've never, who've never been to this kind of a thing before. Um, now, I know you and I have chatted before, and, and it's, been, um, it's always interesting to hear about your time on Doctor Who. So I'm going to start at the top, for those that don't know. Where, at what point um, did you know this, this was going to be the role for you? Um, I, well, um, I, I, I knew when I left John Nathan Turner's office after the first interview. And um, basically what happened was that um, I was offered a, a lead in a soap opera, the equivalent of EastEnders now. Um, it's called Angels. And I didn't want to do it. It was about Brummie Ambulance Men. There was nothing wrong with the series. It was fine. Um, and I, was, I felt incredibly fortunate to be offered the lead in it. But I didn't really want to do it. It wasn't my cup of tea. So I asked my agent if I was up for anything else. And she said, yeah, you're up for a part in Doctor Who. And I thought that sounded like a lot more fun. <laughs> um, literally <laughs> and um, she said but you're, you're not you're not going to be seen for the next five or six weeks they're just not auditioning um, so but I had a pass a BBC pass because I was in a BBC soap opera so I found out where the producer of Doctor Who Mr John Nathan Turner lived where his office was and I went and knocked on the door and um, uh, Jane his um, assistant at the time PA at the time answered and um so it's all down to Jane, really, because she said, oh, well, I'll, I don't think he'll see you, but I'll go and ask, right? Yeah. I went through to another office and John came out and said, come in, come in, come in. I thought, well, nice bloke. Um, and um, I, we, we had a chat and he said, well, do you know, he said, um, we aren't seeing people, but um, as you're here and you've made the effort, I'll get Eric in. Eric's the script editor. We'll have a little bit of a read, see how it goes. Uh, might as well do it as you're here. And... Um, so I read for Eric and him, and um, we we chatted, and I must have just I must have just hit the right note, because at the end of that at the end of that interview and the readings, um, John said, "Would you go out into the other office for a minute?" And he obviously had a chat with Eric, and then I was asked to go back in. And he said, "Look, Mark, you've got the part. We think you're absolutely right for it, um, but you're not allowed to tell anybody because we we have we have to audition for this part. You know, the BBC is a public company; it has to be seen to do things in the in the best right in the right way." Um, so, you know, they, they, did, they did audition for the part, um, but I got it. So um, I sort of knew, yeah, um, it was the easiest audition I'd ever done. Um, I just, it, he, the character just was, wasn't me, but I didn't have to change myself very much. And you've got to remember, I'd just been playing a broomy ambulance man. Um, I mean, I, I'm an actor. It's fine. I can, I can play lots of parts, but it is lovely to play parts that are much more like, like yourself. Of course, of course. Um, how much did you know at that point about just how different Turlo was going to be as a companion? Uh, because there was no companion that had been before whose reason for arriving and staying with the Doctor was to kill him. Yeah, no, I, I knew that immediately because that was in the bit that it was explained to me about the character by John and Eric. And um, I thought that was great. Um, I, I just thought, wow, I'm going to make a bit of a, a splash here. 
Um, and yeah, it's um, you didn't. I didn't realise at the time that Doctor Who was even then such a big thing. Um, I mean, I was a jobbing actor. I was busy. Um, I, 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 yeah, it, it was just one of those things. Um, I didn't yeah. spend my time watching television. Um, so yeah, um, it, you, you, I don't think anybody could have appreciated how how big it was suddenly become. Mm. It was, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so you knew going in that that was. Was there any kind of briefing on um, the the change it might bring to your life? Any idea that you know? I, I'm guessing that you would have got recognised and things in the street. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I got recognised a lot because because I didn't look like a human being. Um, I mean, they they cut my hair really short and dyed it bright metallic ginger, um, and it was supposed to be a washout dye, and it never washed out. So, um, I mean, I was instantly recognisable. Um, kids would shout at me, you know, shout my name as I... Because I used to cycle everywhere in London. And, yeah, it was... It, it never bothered me at all. Um, I I just think that's part of the job. Um, and I don't know what it's like if you're a sort of... Um, I don't know. I think you make the stardom you want, in a way. I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to be Madonna or Lady Gaga or... You know you know what I mean? Or Freddie Mercury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I mean, I'm sure that completely destroys their having a normal life. I mean, I would hate, I would absolutely hate that. Um, I like, you know, to be able to go down the pub and have a beer and a normal chat with my mates at the end of the day. Um, so again, that, that that wouldn't be for me. I suppose I'd have to build a pub in my own mansion, the grounds of my own mansion, and invite my mates in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be it. That, I, I'm, I'm trying now to imagine Lady Gaga sitting down the dog and duck, but um, yeah. she'd, probably, she'd probably give it a go, but you know. Um, so going from there then, first day, first day meeting the rest of the cast, because you're joining, you're joining an established cast. Um, did they make you feel welcome? Well, I, I went along to the studio before to see it being recorded, and that was very, very sensible of John, because at the time the studios were the fastest studios I've ever seen to this day. Um, it really was being done pretty much on one take. Um, and you needed to know that, you know, you needed yeah. to prepare yourself for that. Because we had, you know, experienced actors who absolutely freaked in the studio and just dried in my time on Doctor Who. They, we just had to yeah. stop and, and let them calm down because they just weren't used to working at the pace we were doing it. So I, and I'd worked on a soap opera, so it wasn't like I was a slouch, but I hadn't ever seen it work as fast as Doctor Who did. Um, so I saw them in the studio and I thought they were all really nice. Yeah, I thought they were all ever so nice and my first impressions were right. They all were very nice. Good stuff. Um, so that, where on earth was that pace coming from then? Is that, is that down to the, the nature of Doctor Who, given stuff like effects and all of those things you need to tie in? It was down to the nature of Doctor Who and the budget it was being made on at the time. Um, that the, unless something technically went wrong, there was only time to do one take. Um, right. So unless something went badly wrong, um, the actors didn't get another go. The only reason you got another go was because um, it was 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 because yeah, there's, there was a balls up in the lighting or an effect or you know something like that. Um, so yeah, we'd we'd finish a scene and then they'd play it back on the monitors and they wouldn't be playing it back for our, us. They'd be playing it back yeah, for yeah. them and the tech guys. Um, uh, and we we didn't get second takes. Um, so yeah, I'm, I think it's one of the reasons I got the job. Um, I had been working on a soap opera. I, I, I was already, by the time I joined Doctor Who, a very efficient television actor. I knew my words. I never cocked up. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and John's, John Nathan Turner, the producer's um, boyfriend, um, Gary Downey, had worked as a production yeah. manager on Angels, and he knew. He knew me. He knew how I worked. Oh, of course, yes, yeah, I, I was forgetting Gary was on, Gary was on Angels, I was forgetting that, yeah. And I'm sure John asked him, and I'm sure um, Gary would have said, oh, Mark's fantastic, he's always there on time, he knows his lines, you'll have no problems with him, you know? Any, anyone not turn up on time? Did anyone regularly misbehave in the cast? Never. You, 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 you'd, have, you'd have been out on your ass fast. I was going to say, I guess there's no wiggle room in a in a in a structure like that. There's just not the not the time or space for it. There, there, there isn't. No, no. I hope I'm, I'm, hope I'm, I hope I'm being lively enough. It is eight o'clock in the morning in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> 
Definitely. This is my moment of the day. I'm trying. I'm trying to be sparky. <laughs> it, it, no, no, no. You're coming across very, very well. I, I see. I'm trying to remember. No, I saw you. Oh, it was a few weeks ago. I remember one particular time. I do remember seeing you was when I was. <laughs> I think you'd just come off a 15-hour flight and come straight to yeah. Utopia, and I walked in the back of the room dressed as Wendy Padbury in bubble wrap. And your face. <laughs> there's a photograph where someone's caught your face looking like you've. Am I hallucinating? I've just just flown these fifteen hours, and it was quite something. Well, do you, uh, uh, yeah, I, I actually made a series called Crash Test Dummies for Sky, which right. was Big Chef and Little Chef, right? Um, yeah. uh, the, 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 and and it was a science comedy series, and we were trying to find a way to link the sequences. So I decided we'd dress them only in bubble wrap and get them to do something insane. So I had them, you know, only dressed in bubble wrap, um, skateboarding, only dressed in bubble wrap, skiing. <laughs> it was, bubble wrap's fantastic. Bubble wrap is just funny. I can say something. It's very, very warm. <laughs> just, just ask Wendy. Just ask Wendy. Um, so how long did it take you to kind of settle into the pace of things on Doctor Who? Um, it didn't take me any time at all because I didn't have any choice. Um, what people don't understand, or it comes as a shock to people, is that there was no rehearsal. So I went on a cycling holiday to France. I'd received the script before I left and um, went and had a quick spin through it. And I got back two days before the first day of filming and then I turned up um, uh, for my first morning of filming having learnt my lines, and I did the scene where Turlow walks around the Brigadier's car and he persuades Hippo to get in it and they drive off. And there was no rehearsal whatsoever um, because all the external, all the location shooting was done on film in my day. Um, there weren't such things as video cameras that, that worked on location. Um, and so you did all that with no rehearsal. So whatever I did on that first scene was Turlow. It was a, it was really frightening, um, so I didn't do much. I was sort of quite like me, but with a little bit of evilness layered on top, and um, it was fine. It was fine. People always say um, to me, "You were too old to pay a public school boy." Well, I wasn't supposed to be a public school boy. I was supposed to be an alien. I'd landed my spaceship in the grounds of the school. Somehow I got a school uniform and infiltrated the school. So I was pretty much in hiding. Um, and so they, they say, you know, one, you know, you, you, you were too old. Well, that, that was the idea. I was supposed to look weird. I wasn't supposed to look like a schoolboy. I was 24. There was no way I was going to look like a 16-year-old. Um, and and the, the other thing was, after that first scene, John Nathan Turner sort of signalled to me to, after we'd done the first take. And it was done in a long take. It was a, it was all done in one take. Oh, OK. Um, and so so I drove off and then we came back and um, John John called me over and, and he just took me aside. And um, I wondered what on earth he was going to say. And he said, look, Mark, he said, there's only one thing, he said, can you be a bit posher? And <laughs> John comes from Birmingham and I come from near Birmingham. And I said, I'm really sorry, John, that is as posh as it gets with me. And um, he said, that's fine then. That's Turlow. So there we are. You know, everybody in New Zealand, of course, thinks I'm terribly posh because they think everybody English is terribly posh. Whereas, in fact, I'm terribly middle, I'm terribly lower middle class, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is that thing. There is that feeling. But I suppose that goes with the territory of, of being cast as an alien at a, at a public school. How was the they, car? They, How, they, oh. Yeah, they wanted me to be Daniel Day-Lewis or something, and I'm not Daniel Day-Lewis, yes. you know. All, all but, you know, all, almost there. <laughs> so what? how was that car ride, the, the, the drive and the subsequent crash? Um, it was quite nightmarish in a way, but they did... The, one, one of the treats was I arrived on the location and they gave me the keys to the car and they said, look, Mark, you are going to need to drive this car and you're going to need to drive it fast um, because you have to drive a little bit faster than otherwise you would to make it look as if it's going fast on television. Um, because the camera has a tendency to slow cars down. So I was rattling along when I was going down those lanes. And it was a you know vintage double D clutching car, not the easiest thing to drive. You know, it was a heavy car in terms of the steering. Um, and if you don't know what double D clutching is, you have to pump the clutch in order to change gear. Um, and, and 
they, they gave me the keys and said, off you go for 20 minutes, half an hour, Mark. Come back when you can drive it. So, uh, so that they little little do they know how that, that, that it might have almost crashed more than once. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Now, um, Turlo's Turlo's crystal, the infamous crystal. Yes. Um, yeah. I have read got kind of hot. I mean, there was a, a proper rigged prop, wasn't there, with a light in that I think ran up the sleeve. Yeah, no, no. It, that that that's yeah, the the issue was the studio, not the location um, filming. So yeah. the problem in those days was why, you know, the reason why we wore so much makeup as well was because the studios were lit very brightly. So they would drain your face. Um, and say so you had quite a lot of makeup on. Even news readers did, you know, otherwise you would look like ah, absolutely ashen like a ghost. Yeah. Um, so now, now you're, you've got a thing that's supposed to light up, right? It's supposed to light up in your hand. Now, how are you going to see that when the studio lights are so hard? Um, it's going to have to be a really bright light. Now, these days, of course, they just add it on in graphics afterwards. They do a little bit of a paint and ooh, yeah. glowy, glowy, glowy. Fine. Those days, it had to be for real. So, yeah, I, it, it had a bulb in it, um, a powerful bulb. And then the wire went up my arm, down my shirt, down my leg, out the bottom of my trousers. I think it, it did sometimes, depending on how they were going to shoot it, right? Um, and then that went out to a car battery. And if I moved, and there was a guy holding the car battery. And if I moved, the guy with the car battery had to follow me. Um, but fortunately, how wonderfully oh, BBC. <laughs> well, yeah, I know it was. It was. I don't. I wouldn't say that was primitive. That was just an answer to the issue of very bright studio lights. Um, yeah. I don't think there was a better way of doing it in those days. Um, that we, we didn't have effects in the way. I mean, having said that, you know, Doctor Who was pretty advanced. We were doing blue screen and things like that, which was very new in television. Um, yeah, very much a, a testing ground, I think. Yeah, yeah, we were at the cutting edge. Talking of testing grounds for new technology, um, <laughs> how, how was it working with Chameleon? Um, yeah, well, he's, I mean, that, 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 that's a case in point. Um, that was basically um, over-ambitious um, thinking by John and, uh, and Eric, um, the producer and script editor. Um, robots, you know, Star Wars had come out. Um, it, was, it was big, you know. Um, we, we'd had K-9. Um, but, you know, humanoid, humanoid robots were all the thing. And um, so they, they, they went to this guy uh, uh, and he said to them that they went to, he, he made a, 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 a basically a mock-up of Comedian. And he said, but when you get it, it will walk and talk, I can promise you. And um, I don't know why they believed him. I mean, it's a bold claim. <laughs> because nobody had made at that point a robot that could walk and talk. I mean, they're, they're still not really very good at it. Um, so goodness knows why, why he thought it would work. And of course it didn't work. And, um, so what you ended up was with a thing that could hardly move, which had a tape running inside it to give its lines, um, which we as actors had to work with. And the, the an actor didn't record Chameleon's lines. That was done by the technicians. And so to say that the timing of the lines was strange sometimes would, would be an understatement. Sometimes you'd have to rush your line, right, no, in order I... to get it in between two Chameleon lines. Or you'd have to spend an inordinate amount of time thinking and deliver your line painfully slowly because you knew Chameleon wasn't going to say anything for another 12 seconds. Um, so yeah, it was. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't easy. And um, com I mean, comedian was introduced to be a long-running assistant, um, and that was never going to work because this goes back to the fact that you're only allowed one take. You'd go over to in the studio to a, a comedian scene, and there would be a, just some legs sitting on a chair, and other yeah. bits of his body would be scattered around him. And so we have to cancel that and we have to move on to the next scene. And that started adding time uh, onto the studios. And we couldn't afford to add time onto the studios. So I'm afraid Comedian had, had, had to go. But we have the lovely uh, Mr. Colshaw doing Comedian now on Big Finish um, products. And that's wonderful. He's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, talking a big... Well, it's, it's, yes, I mean, it's quite something, it's quite something. Um, Mind you, Peter Davison, Peter Davison might have never got the part because John could have continued as both Tom Baker and Comedian, so. 
Indeed, indeed. Just, just carried on, carried on. Yeah. How, how was it working with John as Chameleon? I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of an odd concept having someone. I guess finally, Chameleon works. Well, Chameleon works. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and there are no technical problems, and um, and Chameleon delivers his lines fantastically and with fantastic timing. So no, it's it's a, it's an absolute joy working with John. He's such a brilliant man. Do you have any more Turlo adventures in the pipeline? Do you know? Don't. <laughs> it's not um not not, not a good que not a good question in these times, is it? I, I think I'm stuck in New Zealand. Huh? Well, there well there is that, but I know that they they're carrying on recording with people in their various houses, so you know. Oh well, that, I mean that's easy for me because I've got my own facilities. So um, yeah, no, I, I I have done two from New Zealand. I don't like doing them on my own. Um, no. But but um, and I'm due to be well, I was due to be back in the UK three weeks from now, but that's not going to happen. Um, I'm likely to be back about four months from now. So that's that was. I was coming home for five weeks, going away to work for three or four months, and then coming back for the rest of the year. But that's that's yeah. all changed now. Everything is all changed. So what what was the project? What have you got coming up? There is for Channel Five. It was a yeah. And, and I mean, that's that's the bulk of your work now. I mean, in real terms, um, whilst those watching uh, have a, a passion and an interest like me for Doctor Who, in real terms, that's actually that's a, a blink of an eye of your career in some respects, uh, given given what you now do. Do you want to just give a background for those that don't know? My goodness. Yeah, uh, and I will give a background. Um, so I very briefly, I left the UK when I was 30 and I went to do a zoology degree in Australia because I wanted to save the world. I was really worried about the environment. I then came back to London about five years later um, with my zoology degree um, and I sat in a, a, a room and wrote three films. One of them was on the evolution of the kangaroo and National Geographic commissioned it and, and the other film w was Steve Irwin's first film The Ten Deadliest Snakes in the World and I and we wrote I was working for a company called Partridge Films in Bristol at the time and um, we wrote off and we wanted a really good snake handler and Terry sent a video in and four of us watched it in Bristol and we thought he's either going to be a disaster or he's going to be an absolute star and we had yeah. no idea which it would be um, and it was an interesting exercise, but it was the most popular natural history program ever to be shown on Discovery. At the, Discovery was just launching. It was just it was funded by Discovery. It also got shown on ITV, and got enormous viewings. Um, and it broke the mold of natural history. And it sounds amazing now, but it was the first film where the camera was taken off the tripod, um, and you ran with it because. Yeah. And this goes back to Doctor Who. We had a camera called a Digi Beta Cam, which was the first ever video camera that you could right. use on location. So previous to that, all natural history films have been made on film. You can't run around with a film camera, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a clockwork mechanism. It doesn't like it. Um, and, and so everything came together remarkably and it and it was it was it changed the way that people made natural history films and i was the director so i became a name director overnight and um ever since then um the second film i made with steve deadly crocodiles down under it was black wednesday for the bbc it was called um that was shown on itv there was a football match on channel five and to this day <coughs> excuse me it is the night that the bbc has had the lowest percentage of ratings ever um, so I'm also responsible for the BBC's Black Wednesday. I'm sure they've got over it by now. Um, but yeah, but ever since then, I, I mean, I've just been making natural history films. And it's been, um, why? Um, well, I did want to change the way people thought about the world, but I've also had an incredible life. I've worked in over 56 different countries, you know. Um, I've lived in incredibly remote places, seen the most amazing things, things you can't pay to see as a tourist. Um, and And... It's been an extraordinary life. Um, so I have no, no, no regrets at all. But um, yeah, no, um, if, if people want to... I think I've, there's over 500 hours of programming out there now with my name at the end of it, or somewhere near the end of it. Uh, and uh, I can say definitely well worth digging out. So you've lived, you've lived all those various different exciting moments um, as, as, a, as a maker of documentaries. But can any moment in life really compares to the excitement that is working with Janet Fielding. Oh well, yes. 
<laughs> she's probably the most uh, she's probably the most unpredictable animal I've ever worked with. But um, she, um, but no, I mean, I have to say, Janet is a consummate professional in the studio. We were a bloody tight team, um, and we—that's one reason we all got on so well together. Was we were we we never let each other down. We were always there for each other, and uh, yeah, it was it was a joy working with all of them. It's 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 fantastic because it, 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 as a team, I mean, you were very much a part of my growing up. And mm. I remember vividly, um, you know, all of you guys and uh, being that. Then a, a quite a, a dynamic change on Planet of Fire. Um, obviously, your last story and yeah. and, um, and and Nicholas first. Um, how 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 much of you? How much were you instructed to kind of make it an easy? An easy beginning for Nicola. I, I wasn't really. Um, I was more. I was being an actor. I was more thinking how I'd come out of it as my last story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, no. it, so it was. It was my story arc, um, and and I was very very because I chose to leave Doctor Who, and I thought it was a really great story. So I came in with a strong story. I went out with a strong story, and when you look back on them, we never really did any weak stories when I was with Peter. Mm. Um, they were all. They were all great. I'm so glad I came out when I did. Because right. when you know when one character leaves, it's normal that another character comes in. Um, although that didn't happen when Sarah left, really. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's you know another assistant's going to come in, um, but then you, you're not aware they're an assistant. You, you're just thinking they're an American girl on holiday in you know in the Canary Islands. So that's that's fine. Um, and I had enough to think on about without thinking about her. Um, if you see what I mean, I don't mean that in a selfish way. I was trying to get back to my home planet and all those sorts of things. So yes, it was, um, there was there was a bit for me to think about, um, and I, and I, I thought it was great. I got on very well with uh, with Nicola. Um, she again, she was great to work with, very efficient. Um, yeah, super. I think would I work with Colin as an assistant? I think I might have been a bit aggressive and a bit bright, um, a bit clever for Colin. I don't know. I, would Colin have liked me? Not convinced. Would you, have been, would you have been too similar? Because at that stage when he began, obviously, he was fairly... He was uh, fairly, fairly acerbic. Calm. I mean, he, he tried to strangle Nicola fairly early on. That's what I mean. Yeah, I think we would have been. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I left at the right time, I think. Right time, yeah. I think. Did you know when you started that, that was there an allotted time given to you um, or was yeah. it potentially an ongoing situation? I was there for the duration and I chose to leave. But I, but I, I think I made exactly the right creative decision. And, and I think in retrospect, um, I mean, John and Eric think I made the right, right, right decision, um, although they wouldn't have got rid of me. So, um, um, yeah. In, um, in terms of a, what we would now call an arc, which didn't really, you didn't, there wasn't a lot of that happening in television at the time, but, but Turlow certainly has a really nice story that's, that's got, genuinely got a beginning, a middle where he kind of settles down, and then an end yeah. where, you know, he returns off home and the story closes very neatly. A lot of companions don't get that at all, all even now. No, you just feel that they're written out. You know, they're, 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 oh gosh, they're leaving this episode, so they're going to write them out somehow. Um, no, yes. I, I, I agree. I agree. But um, Eric was a very good script editor. So I, all thanks to Eric. Absolutely right. Now, it's on the Canary Islands, certainly there was quite a, am I right in thinking the press were invited out and there was this James yeah. Bond shoot. I mean, was much time given over to what seemed to be a rather ludicrous photo call? Um, not really, no, no. Um, you sort of just got on with it. I mean, we were working from, I mean, we were up at six in the, half past five in the morning and we weren't finishing until dark. Um, you, you, you don't, we were working incredibly hard, the regulars, right? And um, you don't really think about things. You just try and get through the day. Um, yeah. that, so that, that was what I remember about Lanzarote. I do remember how beautiful it was. Um, I, I've never been back there since, but it's a place I would go back to. Um, it's a wonderful volcanic landscape. Um, so yeah, it's 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 it that that was amazing. Another amazing place I've been and haven't had to pay to go. Yes, the, the best way, the best kind of trip. I never pay. I never pay to get on a plane. I think that's it's honestly that's the right thing to do. On that note, just as if we were at a physical event. Um, we have thrown questions uh, open to the audience, so the audience at home 
have sent some in. So I have some here, one of which <laughs> does indeed relate to said photographs. There's quite a few photographs that were taken on Lanzarote. I think you know where this one might be going. This one comes from Mark Cook. It was also asked by a friend of mine, Richard Eno. Um, and they'd like to know, did you have any choice at all over your swimming outfit in Planet of Fire? No. Do you think I would have been wearing Speedos if I'd had any choice on my swimming outfit? I suspect not. <laughs> no. <laughs> so there's the logic on that one. God, anyway. <laughs> should, we, should we leave that one there? We'll leave that one there. Um, Zach. So this is Zach Broom. Um, hello, Zach. Uh, Zach wanted to know what was your favourite funny moment on set? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really boring about this because I do say we didn't have funny moments on set. And, and it is really true because if, you're going, if you've only got one take, you don't fuck up. Yes. Right? You, you do it. And, it's, and so it's, nobody thinks it's funny if you make a mistake. Nobody thinks it's funny if you laugh. They just yeah. get annoyed with you. Um, and so we, we didn't have it's not that we didn't enjoy it we loved it and there was an incredible adrenaline of working that quickly but yeah. um, I mean yes I mean funny things happened I mean you know but because there's nothing you can do about that in the five doctors when the, the Dalek was chasing the the, 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 the Hartnell doctor um, um, and yeah and, and he and the and the, and the the Dalek couldn't stop and ploughed through the set, you know, yes. and, 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 you, and you hear the Dalek saying, shit, Mr. Bugger. <laughs> but the Daleks were, anybody in a monster costume was allowed a bit of leeway, right? Yes. Um, he just lost, yeah, he, he, he lost control. Um, but but that, that's, I can't remember many, many things. I mean, I remember in Terminus where Lisa Goddard and Dominic Gard were in it, and Lisa puts a piece of explosive matter onto the onto the um, the, the the side of a, a corridor to blow a way through, and the explosion was massive. I mean, it was far too big, right? I mean, and it de destroyed half the set, um, and uh, and 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 if you look at Lisa, uh, I mean, she's 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 she had got these bubbles on these helmets as bubbles, oh, right? Yes. And, and 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 she says something like, "What the f u c k," <laughs> right? <laughs> and they had to lay a line over that fitted what she said, um, be because you can't go back. It's a one-off. It's not going to happen yeah. again. Yeah. Fix it in ADR. Yeah. It's the best way. Yeah, and, and so things like explosions and things like that, they had to work. They had they they had to work right. Because if they, you only usually got one go at them, um, yeah. and and the and the story I tell is it was in um, was in um, Frontios where there's a scene in which Peter and Janet and I run out of a cave and there's supposed to be an explosion, and so this was done by having a cannon, an air cannon to the the right of the cave, and as we came out that would blow polystyrene fragments that looked like rock across, right. um, and we would you know duck and shelter and. Uh, Terrible, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So we ran out. There was no explosion. And they there was a pause. And we were obviously expecting them to say, right, go back in. Sorry about that. We'll have another go at it. And they didn't. We were running out of time. They just said, on we go. We'll lay something over it. Forget it. So you never stopped acting in Doctor Who. Even if the explosion didn't happen. You acted as if the explosion had happened. Carry because on. they can right. yeah, carry on because they can add a bang on to it or something, right? Yeah. OK, there'll be no, no rocks coming over, but that doesn't particularly matter in the big scheme of things. In the big scheme of things, what's important is that at 10 o'clock at night, you've got all your scenes done. And when they yeah. pull the handle and the lights go out, you don't have to reset that studio. Uh, you mentioned the five doctors there. There's a, there was a lot of, I mean, it's 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 full of all, all sorts of bits and bobs, and we've heard stories of how it was being rewritten up to the last moment. For you, how much of the 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 kind of the lore of Doctor Who were you aware of prior to doing the five doctors? Not a lot. Um, I, I I I thought that doing a zoology degree would help me understand the science of Doctor Who better, and, and even after four years of that. 
I, I still don't understand Doctor Who any better. I sort of do, but um, but um, it's 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 a world of its own, isn't it? You have to. I mean, that's yeah. what that's that's what science fiction is about. The, one of the joys of science fiction is that if you immerse yourself in it, you'll get a lot more out of it than if you just read it. You know, just just read a book or watch a program just once. You you yeah. sort of need to understand the world of of that of that program or books or whatever. That's yeah. that's it's a like Harry Potter. That's the joy of it that you bring you bring your experience and your knowledge to each as as you gradually you know learn more about more about the program or the books. Um, that's 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 why science fiction is really rather intelligent. Um, I, I I prefer real science, I must admit, but um, I do occasion I, I, I do occasionally dabble in science fiction. Um, yeah. But talking of dabbling in, I can't remember what we were talking about. Yes. Hey, what? Well, I I have got one last. I, know, I, know, I, know. I didn't. I, I wasn't sort of. I, I wasn't bringing a huge wealth of knowledge about Doctor Who and its past and the laws. Uh, and how how everything has to function, right? I wasn't bringing that to it at all. So on that one, one, um, one, one final question. Um, your 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 life has been very much, although obviously being involved in events and meeting fans, um, your, your your life has taken quite a quite a different turn, and and all for the good. Um, given the opportunity to go back for an episode as the program stands now, would you take that opportunity? Yeah, I'd absolutely love it. Um, I, 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 I'd want to be intelligent because Turlow was always intelligent. But no, I'd, I'd, I'd love to go back. Um, yeah, I'd like a really good, serious, meaty plot, wouldn't we all? Um, in in Doctor Who, um, yeah. I mean, that sort of goes back to what I'm talking about science fiction, and the, the I mean, I, I think it's very well acted, Doctor Who. Now, it's it's very well produced, and all those sorts of things. But I do think that. It's it's slightly lost its way in why people watch science fiction. Um, they watch science fiction to to be stretched and challenged, um, and think about new things and in different ways. Yes. Um, and and I think that 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 doesn't mean it has to be serious. It can be enormous fun, but it has to be pushing the barriers somehow. Um, it shouldn't be obvious. Um, and I think yes. that perhaps they could do a little bit more work on that. But that uh, I'll never get I'll never get a job now, would I? <laughs> <laughs> well, if it helps, I'm in entire entire agreement with you on that one. Um, on that note, on that note, we've come to the end of our chat. So I want to say a huge thank you. Uh, what I have been doing is giving uh, people at home because everyone should still feel like life is as normal as possible. I'm yeah. going to give them the opportunity to give you a round of applause. So everyone at home, please give a huge round of applause for Mark Strickson. I will be doing the same right here. And I'd like to say, on behalf of Phantom and myself, Mark Strickson, thank you very much indeed. And I think I should say that the backdrop here is not, this is my 11-year-old son's bedroom. Because, of the, because it was 8 o'clock in the morning, all right? So um, if, if you work out the backdrop, yes, you'll, it, it, it's, not, it's, it's not my private study, I promise you. Well, please say thank you on our behalf. <laughs> my, my pleasure. Okay, well, look, lovely, to talk, lovely to talk to you and keep safe, keep strong and look after yourselves. Take care. Thank you, Mark. Cheers. Thank you.